So I, I was I was going to say um, I I first met you I think when you were running the Silicon Valley Linux users <laughs> yes, group yes. Um, last from the past. Uh, if uh, knows. We have known each other a while. Uh, yes. Um, but you, you actually go around the world and you do a lot of talks um, to yeah. various user groups. Yeah. and uh, So, I mean, are things like user groups still important? Would you still encourage people to join them and, and yeah. participate? And, you know, could you give us some examples of the places you've been and, and what you've been talking about recently? Sure. So, it, first about lugs, you know, user groups in the United States have sort of flagged a bit. Yeah, so, what's true. happened is as Linux became ubiquitous, the little sub technologies became more important and started sort of bifurcating the user groups accordingly. So, so that happened, um, and and some user groups are still quite active. So it's hard to make an overreaching generalization there about a country, right? Three hundred thirty million people. You know? Yeah. But um, yeah. So, but you know, when I was in Jordan, when I was in Egypt, when I was in you know these different places, yeah, it's very much uh, like the original spirit of. The love that we right, 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 uh, yeah. And that there are people like you know, in a lot of ways, open source is new to our region. We're enthusiasts for yes. it, and and of yes. course, their main job is working on something that's proprietary. But yeah, you know, over time, just like it was for us, just yeah. like it was for us. Yeah. So um, you know, it's funny too because in a lot of ways, it's like you know, Europe was leading edge on open source, and now it's totally old news there. And in some ways, the open source groups they're more mature and larger because of it. But here in the United States, it's like our user groups kind of disbanded into subgroups for the different sub technologies, whether it's web design or, or Java or the languages, right? And the actual Linux user groups don't seem as prominent anymore. Well, and then you get to you it know, became it became mainstream. It became yeah, it became and I think people got you, you know work. don't want to do that once once you're doing it for a job. Maybe you don't want to go to the lug meeting. Yeah, you know afterwards. But um, <laughs> and then you know you go places where open source is not quite taken as strong of a hold. And I think the Arabic world, that's true, and also because a lot of the programs aren't really super, you know, right to left by die friendly, and yeah, you don't really have the Arabic uh, localizations and translations, and so you have to count on the English speaking members of those cultures to help you yeah. introduce software to them, and it seems like they're interested in doing that, so that's cool. Um, but yeah, what, you're seeing. What that. about the developing world? I mean, I was in Brazil this year. You know, and there was a I don't tremendous think of amount Brazil of as there. the developing world. I know that sounds really strange, but you know, you have a country of that level of population, that level of economic growth, and that level of economic this and that. What makes them developing? I guess they have a certain number of poor people, so that's what makes them I guess. I, you know. So I don't know that I, I buy the categorization of countries as developing or industrialized or non-industrialized and all the rest. I mean, there are clearly some countries that are so stricken by poverty or by chaos, like, you know, like Somalia or something, yeah. where, you know, but there's probably a, like a thriving Somalian Linux users group. It's because people love to bond over technology. So, so I don't know that I buy that. But we, you actually had a question coming from that. Well, no, it, it, it was just that. Do you think user groups are, are more prominent there? Um, do you think the opportunities are there for people who want to develop um, technology-based business? Sure. To, to so I, I'll tell you what I told create. you know half a dozen people, you know, two dozen people over the last couple of weeks uh, during the, the we had these G Jordan and G Egypt festivals, and I spoke at a thing in Doha. In case you're wondering. Uh, in Qatar, um, and and whenever they would ask me this, they'd say, "Well, how can I use open source to make an open source business?" And the rest, and I say, "Listen, find some open source that you want to use. Find some open source that's productive for you, and just use it. And you know, get to use it productively. Build your systems around that. You know, go do services around that. What you know, whatever was right for them, right? Yeah. Um, and then in using it, you'll see what matters to you. And in seeing what matters to you, you'll know where you'll want to add features, fix bugs, and all the rest. And that's how you get involved." So I always tell people, the first thing you want to do is become a really good user of open source. Understand how to use open source. Because once you do, two million lines of code, they're just waiting for you. Right? Yeah. And that's like, it's literally the equivalent of having, you know, every engineer at Google working for you for 10 years. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's yeah. a staggering amount of productivity. If you know how to use it. If you know how to use it, it's like having an entire computer company, you know, uh, yeah. to the top flight, A-class, whatever you call it, Omega-level computer yeah. company just waiting for you. You just have to know how to figure it out. And once you figure it out, it's all yours. And yet you can still fail if you don't know how to do the business bit. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's yeah. always true. Right? Well, yeah. So yes. it's, it's still a software company. And we've seen, you know, many people, you and I, who have gone into the Started open source business companies. company and yeah. failed. Gone down in flames. Gone yep. down in huge flames. And it's funny, too, because you start seeing the same company restarted 
every two and a half, three years. Whether you know, there's there's one business plan that keeps on popping up. It's like we're gonna be a middleman for open source bounties. Oh yes, and there's yeah, been like yeah. four or five That's of those that I can souls, think of. Uh, well, Spikesource was different, but that one's been done four or five times too, yeah. to different levels of success. And yeah. It's just you know, it's just weird, you know, but. At the same time, there's been plenty of successful people and plenty of people cashing very real paychecks, you know, working for these companies over time. And some of them have been successful, and some of them have had to find new jobs two, three years later. Yeah, so, yeah. I'll and there's no reason to some think. Of those. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to have. <laughs> and it's funny because you know, there's no reason to think that'll be any different in the industrialized world. Now that said, there is a greater stigma on failure in mm -hmm. in a number of the places that I've visited recently. Like the minister for ICT in Jordan, he was like one of the most important things we can do is realize that people are going to screw up and it's not going to work out for everybody all the time and we should make, you know, everything from bankruptcy reform possible but also take away the stigma for failing. Right. And not for fraud, but for failing. Yeah. Right? There's nothing wrong with trying and not succeeding. Right. Yeah. And, and we should build into our economy buffers to allow that because otherwise you're not going to get real successes unless people take risks. And you don't get to take risks without there being a loss on one side. Mm. Right. I mean, you know, it's not risk if there's no if there's nothing to risk, yeah. you know, there's no gain if there's no risk. So, yeah, so it was really interesting to see that. And so maybe that will start spreading. And it's funny because people always want to talk about, you know, the nature of Silicon Valley. And I think a lot of it is that people fail all the time out here. Oh, God. <laughs> so much money goes down the drain just on these ideas. And some yeah. of them sound crazy. Some of them sound totally normal. But no matter how crazy or normal they are, there's yeah, no guarantees. That's an interesting point, that the, the ability to, to fail. Is and the one economic of the, buffers for failure. That's right. It's that one of the interesting here. things around this place, is yeah. that you can go up to Sand Hill, waste 100 million of someone else's money, and <laughs> you know, yeah. and and, uh, and then they'll say, well, never mind, better luck next time. <laughs> kind of, yes. Well, you know, I don't know if that actually happens. But well, you know, I know I, I, I think know of one or two examples. Too, but, examples, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, in return, you take risks. So. Yeah. So yeah. So and the nice thing about open source is, especially if you release it, it's not trapped in bankruptcy court. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the code yeah. does does manage to escape. That's one of the things I managed to put in my contract for the several few jobs is that the code doesn't go down with the ship. Yeah. That that happened to me once yeah. um, with a significant chunk of my time and I never wanted to see that happen again. Yeah. So. Well, you know, yeah, it, it can break your heart. 